Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's uh, What's Up in the Sky program. We have revamped the content to hopefully make it more engaging to viewers. So we are very much looking forward to sharing this video and hearing your feedbacks. Please let us know whether you like this video and if we can improve in any way or form. And remember to subscribe to our channel um, and our Facebook page. Go and like Astronomy's Astronomical Society of Penang. Okay. For this month, we have a new member joining us, joining our team. Grace, who herself is also interested in astronomy, is here to help us present what's up in the sky. More importantly, we would like to highlight that girls also enjoy and are knowledgeable about the stars and astronomy. So welcome, Grace. Hi, thank you. Happy to join the team and I would like to share the astronomy with everyone. Welcome, Grace. Very good to have you. So let us start off this month's What's Up in the Sky with our news member, Grace. All right, thank you. Uh, we start off the month with the moon out of the early evening sky. The bright star you see on the west right after the sun sets is Venus. Just above Venus, the reddish star is the planet Mars fading in the western horizon after a nice opposition in October 2020. As the star gradually appears, one of the first stars you, may, you might see directly overhead will be Arcturus. Towards the northwest, the Big Dipper and the Big Bear is descending towards the northwestern horizon. In the southeast, the prominent constellation of Cross the Southern Cross shines brightly with Alpha and Beta Centauri to the east of Cross. The galactic core rises in the southeast right at the sunset at the beginning of the month and rises earlier and earlier as the month progresses. So the moon out of the way for the early evenings, the starting of July is a good time to capture wonderful images of the Milky Way galactic core rising. For the early risers, the moon starts off July near the third quarter phase. To the west of the moon on July 1st at 6 a.m. are the planets Jupiter and Saturn, both appearing like bright stars in the sky, with the largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, being brighter. In the morning twilight of the east, a clump of stars, the seven sisters or the Pleiades, rises above the V-shape of the Hades. In the west, the summer triangle stars of Vega, Deneb, and Altair are sinking towards the northwestern horizon. The Milky Way cuts its way through the summer tri triangle, making the summer triangle an interesting photographic subject as well. The planet Mercury is always hard to see, and at the beginning of July, it lurks in the morning twilight at about two-fifths widths or 20 degrees north of due east. So, uh, CK Lim, uh, why don't you tell us uh, then what events are happening in the evening sky? Yeah, okay, Dr. Derek, let's come back to the evening sky. With Venus in the evening sky, it is bound to create some interesting celestial meeting. The first one occurs on July the 3rd, when Venus passes in front of the open cluster M44. A pair of binoculars will be required to observe this pair low down near the western horizon in the fading twilight. July the 6th is an interesting day. Um, although you may not feel it or see it because the, the Earth is at epihelion, meaning the Earth is at the point in its orbit where it is furthest from the sun. The Earth's orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle, but rather an ellipse. And so there is a point where the Earth is furthest from the sun or aphelion. And the point where the sun is the closer to the sun, the perihelion. At the Earth's aphelion point at 6.27 a.m. of July 6, the Earth is traveling the slowest in the orbit around the sun. The Earth will reach perihelion about half a year from July the 6th on the January 4th, 2022. On the early morning of Thursday, July 8th, the waning crescent moon meets up with the planet Mercury low in the morning twilight 
in the constellation of Taurus. Monday, July 12th is worth marking on your calendar because on this day, the 2.3 day old moon, Mars and Venus will have a gathering in the evening sky right below the sickle of Leo. Some nice photos should be possible with this trail and the creative storytelling foreground of your choice. Mars and Venus will get closer on July 13th with the pair just under half a degree or one moon width apart. Venus will be on its diverse face. So for those of you with a, bind, uh, with a telescope, do keep an eye on the not very circular form of planet Venus. The first quarter moon occurs on July 17 and on July 21st and 22nd, Venus again has a date, this time with the brightest star in the constellation of Leo that goes by the name Regulus. Shining at a mere magnitude of 1.39, the 22nd brightest star in the sky is outshone by Venus at a brightness minus 3.9 magnitude. But don't be fooled by Regulus feeble light. It's a distant 77 point light years away. In reality, Regulus is 140 times more luminous than our sun. In addition, Regulus has a very high rotation rate of 15.9 hours versus sun's 28 days. Regulus rapid rotation caused it to have highly oblate shape and a planet around Regulus would see an oval shaped sun. So Derek, what other interesting can you tell us that's happening in July? Yes, CK. Uh, yeah, there's, there's still some more very interesting things going on. So July's full moon, which occurs on July the 24th, is called the Buck Moon. Okay, and it's, as with all the other full moons, it rises right at sunset. And this full moon is called the Buck Moon because at this time of the year, the new anthers start to sprout on, on these uh, male deers. When we observe the full moon, we'll find out that the moon actually has two companions. The planets Jupiter and Saturn accompany the moon on July 25th and the 26th. The moon, Jupiter and Saturn will appear together. Speaking of Jupiter, the planets dance with its four Galilean moons are always fun to observe through a telescope. So if you have a telescope, ideally with at least a three inch or 80 millimeter aperture, mark your calendars for the early mornings of July 22nd and July 30th. At about 3.30 a.m. in the morning of July the 22nd, three Galilean moons, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede will be positioned right beside Jupiter with Europa casting a shadow on Jupiter. Also at 4.15 in the morning of July 30th, Io and Callisto cast a shadow on Jupiter, a double transit event worth waking up for. The two moons will proceed to cross in front of Jupiter and the, with the great red spot also in view. So continue to observe or image the event and create that awesome GIF video and share it with us. With all this excitement with Jupiter in the month of July, let us go back to Grace to wrap up all the celestial events for the month of July here. A few days after the full moon is also a good time to take photos of the stars in the early evening as the moon rises about an hour later each day, giving us a progressively larger window for photography before the moon rises. On July 29 and 30th, point to the west too for another date between two celestial objects. This time is Mars and Regulus, low down in the fading twilight. The color contrast between the red of Mars and the whitish blue of Regulus makes a colorful pair in the early evening sky. The days between Venus conjunction with Regulus and Mars conjunction with Regulus see the three objects just flipping within about a seven times 50 binoculars field of view. The moon's third quarter phase on July 31st punctuates the series of interesting astronomical events for July 2021. Okay, so thank you very much, Grace and CK, uh, on this 
what's up in the sky for July. And now it's time to talk about the constellation of the month. And Sagittarius is our constellation of the month for July. Perhaps the most characteristic of the constellation of Sagittarius is the teapot shape seen right here on the screen. And in truth, Sagittarius depicts a centaur holding a bow and arrow with the arrow aimed at the heart of the scorpion. So here is the centaur and the arrow. Uh, clearly the graphic does not uh, really depict this, but uh, the heart of the scorpion is Antares right over here. And Sagittarius is supposed to be aiming the arrow right at the heart of the scorpion. So Sagittarius is an interesting constellation because it contains many beautiful deep sky objects. Most popular, perhaps, are the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae, Messier 8 and Messier 20. Both nebulae are H2 regions, meaning that they are stars that have, have just formed or are forming in the nebula. The H stands for hydrogen. H1 represents the neutral state of hydrogen, and H2 stands for the ionized hydrogen. The Lagoon Nebula surrounds an open cluster called NGC 6530, seen right here. And the Trifid Nebula is named after its tree lobe appearance. The tree lobes being a result of a dark nebula in front of the Trifid H2 region called Barnard 85. The dual object combo of M8 and M20 are favorite targets for astrophotographers because of the nebula's rich reddish H alpha emission and the blue from the reflection of starlight by dust in the nebula. Sagittarius is also famous for its globular clusters. Globular clusters are highly concentrated clusters of several hundred thousand stars that are gravitationally bound, giving them a spherical shape. Globular clusters are in orbit around the cores of galaxies, and since Sagittarius contains the core of our Milky Way galaxy, the constellation is littered with globular clusters. Among the popular globular clusters in Sagittarius on the Messier list are M22, M28, M54, M55, M69, and M70. There are many more smaller ones on the NGC list as well. Most notable of these globulars are M22 and M55. They are basically the brightest. At an apparent magnitude of 5.5, M22 is brighter than the more popular Hercules cluster M13 that shines at about magnitude 5.8. Look for M22 in binoculars or telescope. It is just east of Caos Borealis, the star that is the top of the lid of the teapot. While you're aimed at Caos Borealis, just about a degree north and slightly west is M28, a magnitude 7 little gem of a globular cluster. M55 is a little harder to find. Extend an imaginary line from Caos Media to Acela to the southeast by the same distance will get one close to the cluster. Shining at just under magnitude 6, M55 appears bright in binoculars with its outer stars resolvable in small telescopes. Of course, one can't talk about Sagittarius without talking about the galactic core and its vicinity. Near the galactic core are the open clusters M18, M21, M23, and M25. All of them a nice view through binoculars. The Sagittarius star cloud M24 is fun to explore with dark nebulae crisscrossing its starry landscape. M17, or the Omega Nebula, includes an open cluster and is also a popular astrophotography target. It can be easily seen with binoculars, although a telescope is required to bring out more details in the nebulosity. With the myriads of objects within the constellation, Sagittarius is a constellation worth spending hours exploring. On one occasion, while scanning the Milky Way between Scorpius and Sagittarius, a meteor flashed through my field of view. This was about 30 years ago, and until today, I still remember the meteor that streaked through my view like it was yesterday. A truly magical sight to remember for a lifetime. So that will conclude our What's Up in the Sky program this month, with the constellation of the month being Sagittarius. Hope you enjoyed our content. Wow, that's interesting. I can't wait to go out and explore the constellation with my binocular. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So CK, uh, are there any other interesting objects in Sagittarius, you know, as a experienced and seasoned astrophotographer, maybe you can recommend to uh, 
our viewers to take a photo of or observe? Um, yeah, actually, um, Sagittarius, as you know, is the center of our galaxy, right? So uh, for a lot of photographers out there, they definitely would like to take this part of the uh, constellation because it's the, the heart of the Milky Way itself. And other than the uh, object that uh, Derek mentioned earlier, there are a lot more objects in the constellation of Sagittarius itself. There are a lot of nebulas, you know, nebulae, you know. Um, but you won't find a galaxy there because we are at the we are looking at the center of the galaxy uh, of our galaxy. So we will we will see a lot of dust. We will see a lot of nebula. See a lot of stars, you know. Um, no there is a galaxy. galaxy. Sorry. It's a Sagittarius yeah. dwarf galaxy. Sorry, you won't see it though. It's very dim. Yes, it's yes, it's dim. Like yes. In the sky safari. Yeah. So good thing about Sagittarius, you can see um dark nebula also. So. Well, that's very interesting, CK. Um, I think that uh, yeah, one of the things that uh, I did not mention about in Sagittarius that's very interesting to observe even in binoculars, you know, Grace, uh, um, the dark nebula. Okay, I mean, I, I, I made a passing mention in tri with the Trifid Nebula, but but uh, um, there are many, many more dark nebulae in Sagittarius. So, yeah, that's that's a very interesting point, CK. Yeah, so um, I think uh, with that, let us conclude this month's session. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please remember to hit a like, even if you didn't like this video. And click subscribe, even if you don't want to hear from us again. Um, just subscribe and just do it. And, uh, you know, we hope to see you next month in August with our next uh, What's Up in the Sky program. Take care, clear skies, and live long and prosper.